Well, the country has managed to survive one year of Joe Biden as president, and while there's a lot of things to critique, there's actually one thing that we can all be very thankful for, for a Joe Biden presidency. We're going to talk about that. We're also going to discuss Democrats on the floor of the House of Delegates here in Virginia who have informed all of us that CRT is, once again, no longer in any of our schools, but if it was and you didn't like it, well, then it's because you're a racist. All that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument, where we make the arguments to defend a free society. All right, first things first, before we go into the year in review of Joe Biden, I want to address something that took place on the Virginia House of Delegates very recently. So we've been in session for about a week, and for about a week, we've been told how we're all racist, bigots, sexists, etc. Why? Well, because we don't want Democrat policies, and neither apparently do the people of Virginia. But there was a specific episode that happened on the House floor where one of my Democrat colleagues got up and proceeded to talk about all of the bad things within U.S. history books. Now, interestingly enough, Delegate Glenn Davis pointed out that all the bad things within those history books that that gentleman was referring to were actually put in there under Democrat administration. So that's a fun little tidbit. But one of the remarks that he made that I thought was especially insulting to any of us that have been, you know, paying attention is that he said that CRT is not in public schools. Now, I've addressed this before, but I thought it was necessary to once again re-engage on this debate on the House floor. So what I want you to do is listen or watch very quickly to my response on the Virginia House of Delegates floor to Delegate Ken Plum's accusation that there is no CRT in our public schools. The delegate from Culpeper, Delegate Freitas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Rice for a point of personal privilege. The delegate has the floor. So actually, there's a lot of things that uh, the delegate just mentioned that I, I certainly agree with. I think any sort of textbook that would have sense to gloss over slavery, gloss over important parts of the Civil War, is actually reprehensible and does a disservice to all of our students. Another thing that I think does a service to all of our students and to the debate that's been taking place over subjects like CRT is to have us constantly be told that CRT is nowhere within our schools. Well, that's fascinating because I've never seen so many people so upset about somebody removing something from public schools that everybody claims is not there. And I can remember being in a, in a debate not that long ago where somebody made that similar claim. And in fact, they made the claim that anybody that said that CRT was within our public schools was doing so for purposefully divisive reasons. And of course, there was the, the subtle implication that you had to be a racist if you had a problem with it in the first place. And so I pointed out by going to the Virginia Department of Education website, and I went on to the Roadmap for Equity, which is a government site. And as you go through there, there was quotes from even Max Kendi, Robin DiAngelo. If you go into the different curriculum, the different uh, places that they sent teachers to for resources, it heavily included CRT. So this idea that because I can't go to my kid's class and see on their syllabus CRT 101, that that means that CRT is not being used to heavily influence the way that the teachers teach the class is intellectually dishonest in the extreme. And the example I like to use is that if we came up with some sort of scheme where we said, you know what, it's really good for teachers to go through ethics training along with cultural competency. They're going to go through ethics training. And the way that we're going to arrange the ethics training is going to be exclusively taught by the Catholic Church or some other religious institution. And in order for them to get their license, renew their license, or go back into the classroom, they have to go through all of these different seminars that are taught specifically by religious figures. I'm willing to bet that we have colleagues in this room on the other side of the aisle that would get up and say, wait a second, you're allowing a particular religious sect to overly influence the conduct of ethics training, and this is going to affect the way that the teachers go into the classroom and teach their subject matter. And you know what? You'd be correct. But now all of a sudden, when it comes to the issue of CRT, you can put all of these requirements, you can use it as the, the resources, you can tell teachers that they have to go through the training, and then you want me to believe that when they go into the classroom, that doesn't affect the way that they teach? See, it would be one thing. It would be one thing if it was, here's a particular theory that we're going to debate about in class amidst other theories attempting to explain different phenomena. But when you say, teachers, you're going to go through this training, we're going to teach it as the way to view reality, economics, history, and then go into your classrooms and use that worldview, use that lens in order to teach every subject, you don't get to come back here and tell me that it's not influencing things within our public school system. And quite frankly, we've had this argument before. We had it during the election cycle. 
And parents overwhelmingly saw the evidence and they were convinced that this was going on and they considered it to be a problem. So again, if the debate wants to be, let's take various issues and let's have a robust discussion from multiple points of view and perspective in order to come to a conclusion about what happened and properly educate our kids, I don't think you're going to find a lot of disagreement about that. But there's definitely going to be disagreement when we tell all of our teachers, go through this training, teach these classes through this lens, and then because it doesn't appear on a syllabus in my kid's fourth grade class, you get to come back and tell me it's not there? I'm sorry. That is intellectually dishonest. And that's the sort of thing that we need to remove from our schools because, quite frankly, I'm not in the business of trying to come into this body and say, I don't like what Democrats might have done with education, so instead, I don't like a particular ideology, so I'm going to replace that ideology with mine. That's not what I'm attempting to do at all. That's not what the governor's attempting to do. The big push that we've had during this session that you're going to see is about choice. It's about putting decisions back into the hands of the actual consumers of education. Because we can argue all day long about what quality looks like. We can argue all day long about what diversity looks like. We can argue all day long about what equity looks like. But if we really want to get to it in a way, in a substantive way that affects the very students that we're all trying to help, then we're going to have to put more power into the hands of the people that are actually getting the service instead of reserving for us some sort of special privilege to dictate on high to parents, students, and teachers what it is that's going to be taught. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now, the critical part that I've, argument that I've tried to make on, in this floor speech, and I've made in committee, and I've made online, is that Democrats will claim that because there's not a CRT 101 class, right, that CRT is not in your public schools, right? Well, that's not exactly what we're arguing here. What we're saying is that when you put this all within the teacher's curriculum, when you tell the teachers, and you have an expectation that the teachers will not only learn CRT, but then they will reflect it within their lesson plans and the mannerisms in which they teach, it, it's so much worse than just having a CRT class, right? A CRT class, you could at least make the argument that, okay, maybe we're going to discuss multiple perspectives on a particular issue. But when you tell your teachers that they have to go through cultural competency training, and that cultural competency training is taught in large part by people that subscribe to CRT, you're doing something very different. What you're doing is you're creating a core of teachers which have been taught that they are expected to go into their classroom and view every subject through the lens of CRT. Not CRT as a theory, but CRT as fact. And then that's supposed to be reflected in how they teach, history, math, civics, and everything else. That's the problem. But I want to draw your attention to another portion of the argument that I was making here, and that is very simply that we're not trying to replace Democrat-imposed ideology with Republican-imposed ideology. Right? The Democrats are very mad. They want to impose ideology within the public school system because they think that's appropriate. Okay, I do not. And, and maybe there's some Democrats that do not, but you know what? They're not standing up and saying anything if they do. And the argument that I was making is not, no, we want to replace CRT with our version of ideology. No, we want to replace what they've attempted to do for the last two years in Virginia with a system that puts more power in the hands of the consumers of education. Right? When you go into the store, you don't judge the quality of the store or of the restaurant or wherever else you go to purchase something or to receive a service. You don't judge the quality based off of what some politician has told you is quality or not. You judge based off of whether or not it works for you. And that's what we want for education. And what's amazing about this is that it actually empowers people on the left side of the spectrum to be able to find education that works best for their child. Now, I might disagree with it. They might disagree with what I want to teach my child. But I think we can all agree that there's certain core standards. We want people to be literate. We want people to do basic math. We want people to understand basic components of civics and how our system operates. But when it comes to these more controversial issues, we don't need to mandate these on high from a government agency. And that's the core difference. Republicans think that we should take that control, give it back to parents to be able to make decisions within a marketplace of ideas and educational options and opportunities. Democrats think, no, 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 the government needs to control this and we need to have a monopolistic approach to how we provide education. So you choose. And I don't mean just you choose as a conservative or as someone on the left. I mean you choose as a parent. Do you want to have more control over what your child's education looks like, over what the opportunities may be? 
Or do you want to leave it to a body within the General Assembly? Because that's the real option here. You're not choosing between Democrat ideology with respect to curriculum or Republican ideology with respect to curriculum. You're determining whether or not you want us to choose for you or whether or not you would like to choose for yourself. And I can tell you right now which system I'm committed to. And that's the one where you get to choose. And again, you may choose things that I wouldn't personally choose. But it's not my business to try to micromanage your life. And if you think that's a good policy, well then, quite frankly, some of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle need to hear that. Because they are absolutely transfixed on this idea that this is going to be a question or a, a problem that we solve through politics as opposed to giving people more control over their own life. And that is the real nature of the argument that we're seeing right now within the General Assembly. All right, let's move on to a year of Joe Biden. Well, first of all, let's acknowledge something. Joe Biden was not elected to be some sort of progressive, transformational president. I don't think anybody elected him to do that. There was no real expectation that he was going to do that. But he has certainly made the attempt. So the Joe Biden that you might have seen giving Senate speeches 30 years ago is certainly not the Joe Biden that is currently sitting in the White House. And we're actually seeing this across a wide swath of the Democratic Party. People that have actually been in positions of leadership for decades are now changing their rhetoric in such a way as to reflect the more radical left-wing elements within their own party. Right, The Overton window on the Democratic Party has shifted. The thought leaders are not Joe Biden. The thought leaders are not even Chuck Schumer. The thought leaders are AOC, The Squad, Bernie Sanders, and Elizabeth Warren. They're the ones driving the narrative. And Joe Biden is just trying to catch up. But the fact that he's not pushing back on some realm is, quite frankly, a betrayal of what he actually ran on when he was trying to get both the nomination for the presidency and then to win the presidency. And so when he has gone in here, he has gone in with a high tax, high government spending, more government controls, more lockdown, more mandates. And the problem is, is that he has actually been failing in all of his key objectives. And not just because of Republicans, because quite frankly, we don't control the House. We don't control the Senate. We don't control the presidency. So he's been failing within his legislative agenda because he can't even get some of his own Democratic members of his party to come alongside with it, especially when it comes to things like getting rid of the filibuster. Now, I want to stress something very quickly here, because there's a lot of people that will look at the filibuster and they'll say, well, this is undemocratic. Well, again, we're a constitutional republic, not a democracy. And one of the things that we have understood from the very beginning of our nation's founding, even though we haven't always lived up to it, is that we recognize that government uses force in order to achieve its objectives. It's very different from the private sector in that regard. And so all of these different things that we do with respect to separation of powers between local, state, state, federal, House of Representatives, the Senate, the executive, the judiciary, all of this separation of powers was specifically put in place to slow down the process because we recognize that when government is using force to achieve its objectives, somebody is going to get hurt. And the filibuster is one of the processes that we use to actually protect the minority. And if you don't believe the Democrats have you know, appealed to that in the past, go look back at what people like Chuck Schumer were saying you know, not that long ago when they were in the minority. They saw the filibuster as an important institution in order to slow down the process and make sure that we had genuine consensus before we move forward with implementing policy that inevitably was going to hurt people or take away something and give it to another person. It slows down the process because ultimately, if you want a really efficient government, let me go ahead and give you one right now. You want to know probably the most efficient government in the world right now? North Korea. Kim Jong-un says something and man, it is done or else he feeds you to his dogs. And quite frankly, we don't want that here. So this is not just about obstructionist behavior. This is about creating a slow, deliberative process to make sure that before we impose something on 330 million Americans, we have a great deal of consensus behind it. And that consensus is not found in a simple majority vote in a lot of these cases. Right? There's a reason why amending the Constitution takes more than a majority. There's a reason why Senate processes have been created in such a way 
in order to slow down the debate and make sure that, again, we gain that sort of consensus. So Joe Biden has completely flipped on that, trying to get rid of the filibuster. They talked about stacking the courts. You've actually got some Democrats now advocating that the Senate is undemocratic and therefore should be abolished. Joe Biden has gone hardcore and pushing back against law enforcement. He's trying to spin hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars that we don't currently have. And then he goes out to the public and says, well, no, no, it's already paid for, when we all know it isn't. We have inflationary monetary policy, which, if we're going to be intellectually honest, we have to admit has been a problem of both Republican and Democrat administrations, but they really kind of pushed the gas pedal down or continue to push the gas pedal down during the Biden administration. He's tried to legislate through executive order. And by that, I don't mean executive orders telling executive branch agencies what to do within the law. I mean, he's tried to use OSHA regulations to punish literally tens of millions of workers if they don't get whatever version of the vaccine Pfizer happens to be pushing today. And when I say that, I don't mean I'm anti-vaccine, but this idea that the government could deprive you of your ability to be able to provide for your family if you don't take what the Pfizer lobbyist is currently encouraging, that's problematic. And I would hope that all of us would be able to understand that regardless of which political party is in power, there is something seriously wrong about completely subverting the legislative process in order to try to use some obscure regulations to impose something on tens of millions of people and potentially cost them their livelihood in the process. And speaking of that, if you want to understand why we've had a supply chain problem, a lot of this has to do with regulatory policy. It has to do with artificially creating shortages based off of vaccine mandates. And if you want to understand why we have ships or why we had ships sitting off the coast of ports, not able to unload, and when we say this is a regulatory issue and Democrats come back and say, well, what does Joe Biden do to create that? It's not just Joe Biden. It's Democrat policy at the federal, state, and local level where they actually create contracts that make our ports highly inefficient compared to the rest of the world. And now, again, we're seeing a microcosm of this in Virginia. And one of the reasons why everybody, all eyes were on Virginia with respect to the last gubernatorial election is because, one, Virginia is one of very few states that have off-year elections from the federal elections. I actually like that. It, it, it's kind of a pain because there's an election every year in Virginia, but what it also does is it gives Virginia an opportunity to make decisions, not just based off of the federal rhetoric, but also in response to it. And what we saw in Virginia, and, and keep in mind, the last 10 years have been really tough for, Virginia, for Republicans in Virginia, for conservative philosophy in Virginia. It started with losing the governorship, losing the AG, uh, the attorney general, losing the lieutenant governor. And then we lost a ton of seats in the House of Delegates. We lost the Senate. And then finally, we lost the House of Delegates. So Democrats controlled all mechanisms of government in Virginia for the first time in a while. Now, when they came in, did they come in? They, now, again, keep something in mind. Many of them campaigned on more of this kind of moderate approach to government. They, they campaigned on a lot of intentions. But as soon as they got in power, it was full bore left-wing progressivism. The moment Governor Ralph Northam got caught with a picture in his yearbook with blackface and a KKK robe, all of a sudden, the liberal progressive agenda was on full display. Every bill that they wanted got through, rubber stamped, very little debate, very little deliberation. And Virginians got a chance to look at it for the next two years. Now you compound that against Joe Biden getting into office and running the way he did on the federal level, which again, he ran as kind of this middle of the road moderate, got in there and pushed left-wing progressivism. And so the election in Virginia was not just a rejection of what left-wing progressivism has done in Virginia. It was also a pushback about what Joe Biden has done. Because no matter what this guy has touched in the last year, he's either failed to produce, or in the case of things like Afghanistan, he has completely botched up the things that he has responsibility for. And so the question that was on the ballot in Virginia was not just about Terry McAuliffe or Mark Herring or Hala Ayala. It was also about Joe Biden. But more than that, it was, a, it was about this debate between extreme left-wing progressivism 
and certain notions that we all have about who we are as a people and what we are as a nation. And the argument that I would, I would make to you that we're, we're experiencing now within the Virginia House of Delegates, and which will be played out all this year with, with midterm elections, is what sort of country do we want to be? In Virginia, what sort of commonwealth do we want to be? And this is why I'm going to draw you back to the argument I made in the floor speech that you watched earlier. This cannot simply be a debate between which political party is going to shove their particular ideology down the throats of whether it's 8.5 million Virginians or 330 million Americans. This has to be a resurgence of the passion that we, we should have for the idea of individual liberty. Because what individual liberty is really about, if, if you really just boil it down to its key element, it's about respect. It's about respect for the fact that you as an individual have a right to live your life the way you want. And provided that you're not infringing on the rights of others, you're not depriving them of life, liberty, and property, then you should be able to make decisions for you. But the other side of that is that we should all also accept responsibility for our decisions. Now, some people look at this and they, they think, well, this seems kind of isolationary. This idea that we're all just individuals. That's not what American individualism has been about. American individualism has always been about being able to, to chart your own course, but understanding along the way that there's other people with you and voluntarily stepping in and helping people when they need it and being able to accept and receive help when you need it. But you can't replace that with a government mandate. You can't replace that with a government subsidy. That has to be something that we're committed to as individuals with a strong sense of community. So as you follow what we're doing in the Virginia General Assembly, and as you follow what people are running on within the midterms, the thing that I would ask you to truly analyze with respect to the policies presented or the arguments presented to defend them is what sort of country are they moving us to? What sort of commonwealth are they trying to produce here in Virginia? Is it one where you have more choices, more freedoms over your own life? Is it one where government respects its boundaries in order to respect your autonomy and ability to make your own choices? Or is it one where politicians are promising you that if you just give them more power, they will take care of you? Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care how nice that may sound. We have seen it playing out. And I don't know how many examples we have throughout time and space. And the bottom line is it doesn't work. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have compassion for people that need assistance or need help. But we have to make it a personal responsibility because the bottom line is you can't delegate responsibility for your life to a government agency and you can't delegate your responsibility to help others in need to a government subsidy. And that's the choice that is truly on the ballot in the midterms this year. And it's the choice that we're going to be debating within the Virginia House of Delegates to this legislative session. And I already know what I believe. I've ran on it. I've legislated that way. I voted that way. I've spoke that way. I truly believe in the right of each individual to be able to chart their own course for their life. And my job is to protect their ability to do so. But all of us are going to have to accept the responsibility for our choices and the responsibility to be good stewards and to be able to take care of those that we care about, not because the government forced us to do it, but because we have genuine empathy for others. Once again, thank you for joining us on Making the Argument with Nick Freitas. We will see you next episode and keep following what we're doing on social media because we will give you regular updates about what is going on in the General Assembly on the policies and issues that matter most to you. Once again, thank you very much. We'll see you next episode.